Hello and welcome to the Lebanese Politics Podcast. My name is Nizar Hassan, joined by Timur Azahari and a very special guest today, Ziad Majid, political researcher and commentator. Uh, you must have heard his or, or watched his analysis somewhere um, and we're really happy to have him on the show. Welcome to the show, Ziad. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Happy to have you. Do you want to introduce yourself quickly for those who don't know you? Yeah, I'm uh, Ziad Majid. I teach uh, politics and history at the American University of Paris, and I coordinate uh, the program on the Middle Eastern studies. Thanks for coming on the show, Ziad. We're very excited to have you, not only because we've been wanting to host you since, uh, you know, basically last year or the, the year we started the show, but also because we're passing through a, a very difficult time politically and a difficult time to make sense of uh, with all what's happening and the different interests and regional forces that are at stake. Uh, so you, you've proven that you're, uh, you, you make it much easier for people to understand these uh, political complications and dynamics. So it's great to have you. And today we'll be... Um, after we go over some news, we'll be focusing on the issue of political impunity in Lebanon and uh, the role of uh, the Syrian regime, the comeback of the Syrian regime, but also the influence in Lebanon and how it relates to different issues such as the port investigation or the uh, political assassinations, etc. Before that, let's go over some news. Right. So, so this week, I mean, we we really had two two major events, um, and and the the first one was the you know the beginning of the vaccine rollout. Uh, in in the past uh, couple of weeks, you know, I mean, Lebanon has been in a lockdown for the, for almost uh, two months now. Um, we've uh, we've seen the vaccine rollout begin, and and cases cases sort of stabilized around two thousand, and the the lockdown is set to continue throughout March in some fashion. Um, now, when the vaccine rollout began, uh, we had, if you recall, this issue of Wasta and this issue of who gets to get the vaccine. And there were all of these reports that Lebanese officials had tried to secure the, you know, the few tens of thousands of, of vaccines that came as the first batch for their entourages. This led to sort of uh, public statements by World Bank officials. The World Bank is funding uh, much of Lebanon's vaccines, where they basically pledge that there's going to be no wasta, which means no favoritism or no nepotism in the dis- distribution of these vaccines. So how did it happen? Well. It's uh, it's 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 been a, a mixed start uh, in that sense. Uh, the there's a, a a government platform, the Impact platform, which sort of uh, provides data on the vaccine rollout and on very various other issues as it relates to the the pandemic in Lebanon. And what they said uh, is that of the twenty five thousand vaccines that were given out uh, during the past week. Only 12,000 of the people who got the vaccines had been people who registered on the online platform. And that online platform is supposed to be the only way and the transparent way that you get to do the vaccine. So for those who haven't done it yet or don't know, basically you go in and it's, it's a very smooth, quick process. Uh, you go on this platform and you put in you know, certain things like your profession, your age, whether you have any comorbidities. And during the first phase of the vaccine rollout, it was really supposed to be limited to frontline healthcare workers and those above 75 years of age. We've had at least a few cases, documented cases of people who are not in those groups getting it. And it is rather worrying that of, of 25,000 vaccines, again, that, are, that were given out, only 12,000 have conformed to the standards that were set out by this government platform. So, so we had more vaccines arrive on Saturday. Um, that's yesterday. We're recording this on Sunday. Um, they're again in the low tens of thousands that, of vaccines, and we we basically expect this to happen on a weekly basis. Batches, you know, keep coming in, and 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 that's to do with the storage capacity in Lebanon and also the capacity to give them out. Uh, we we expect the vaccination campaign to wrap up in the next months. And there's just a note here that you know, amid this pandemic and and the continued you know prevalence, of rather rather high number of cases, two thousand a day, we got news that there are going to be by elections by the end of March. The Interior Minister said this. Uh, Lebanon has 10 parliament seats that are vacant, two by MPs who died of COVID uh, between January and February, and eight uh, due to MPs who resigned after the August Beirut blast. So it's going to be interesting to see how you know Lebanon plans to hold these by-elections at a moment where it really still is in the eye of the storm as, as far as it goes with the, with the COVID pandemic. Yeah, and it's just, it will be interesting to see whether, uh, depending on political uh, potentials, whether these elections will be postponed or not, because, you know, uh, our politicians didn't have a problem postponing the elections a few times before when the politics were, weren't very suitable or, you know, the general popular situation. So 
right now with the COVID-19 situation, but also with the with the, with the hesitance of a lot of opposition and anti-establishment political groups to go into these uh, by-elections. Uh, it's 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 a tricky decision, but I think you know there's enough motive for uh, the ruling political parties to actually go for it and hold the elections, even if the turnout will be low because they have higher chances of doing it when there aren't new forces around. Yeah, it's, I think that's an interesting question, which maybe we can get into and ask Ziad in a little bit about, about why actually, you know, the political decision to hold these elections at this moment, when we know that in the past elections can be very easily postponed and we in fact didn't have elections for nine years um, between 2009 and 2018. The, the second piece of news, though, that we have to get to, and that really sort of made all the headlines this week was the removal of uh, the Beirut blast investigator, the judicial investigator, Fadi Sawan. So we learned on, on Thursday that the Court of Cassation uh, had decided to remove Fadi Sawan uh, based on a complaint by two suspects. Uh, they are former ministers and current MPs, Ali Hassan Khalil and Ghazi Zaiter. They're from Nabih Birri's block. And so just a quick summary of what happened here is that as you recall, Fadi Sawan in December charged the outgoing prime minister and he charged three former ministers, uh, Yusuf Tanyanos, Ghazi Zaiter, and Ali Hassan Khalil. Ali Hassan Khalil and Ghazi Zaiter then went forward and submitted a complaint, basically trying to get him removed from the case. That was December, uh, that was mid December, and the ruling comes down, uh, you know, mid last week. Fadi Sawan is removed, and, and it's sort of a, a pretext that, that raised a lot of eyebrows. Uh, the 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 reasons given were there were two main reasons and one of the reasons was that Fadi Sawan's house his home in Ashrafi had been damaged by the blast and many people found this sort of ludicrous because the Beirut blast was one of the largest non-nuclear explosions in history it pretty much affected everybody in the country and if you lived anywhere in Beirut you probably had broken glass you probably knew someone who was injured and sadly probably someone who died and so this idea, uh, the idea uh, or, or the, the reasoning in this judgment was that Fadi Sawan uh, was probably emotionally impacted by this and couldn't be impartial. And the second reason was that Fadi Sawan had declared that he would not abide by the red lines of political immunity that politicians charged in the, uh, in, the in the case have been so intent on on keeping, uh, you know, maintaining uh, as red lines. Yes, this whole thing was a bit confusing, right, Timur? Because on one hand, someone wasn't like the politically courageous uh, judge who was, you know, uh, fighting everyone. Or I mean, he charged a couple of ministers and the prime minister. They didn't, um, they didn't come for the interrogation. But still, like overall, he wasn't like the kind uh, of, of political judge who was uh, who was aligned with a certain political agenda or uh, against a certain political agenda or politicians. In a sense, he was a bit disappointing to both sides, right? Disappointing to the ruling class for not being maybe uh, co-opted enough and disappointing to the anti-establishment movement for not being bold enough. Uh, so this, uh, the, the, him being you know, sacked or removed from this position is, is a bit confusing for in, in that sense, um, that uh, what are the lines that he did cross? And what are the lines that you know his uh, successor will um, will not be able to cross? Because uh, I don't think that we know enough about that. You know, it doesn't seem like we know enough why exactly uh, they wanted someone to be removed, or what exactly is are the lines that someone crossed or didn't. Yeah, I'd say the the important point here, and the point that was also raised by legal experts like Nizar Sari, you know, the head of the the watchdog NGO, the Legal Agenda was that you know, this ruling clearly stated that Sawan was removed partially because he decided to, to go against the red lines. And so that sets a precedent for the new judge. Does the new judge then abide by these red lines? Because he's seen that the person before him was removed for going against those red lines. And so that is really the important question. You know, people, uh, you know, legal experts like uh, Sari have said that the new judge who was appointed, Tariq Bitar, um, is is someone who's he's a young judge, he's competent, and he has a good reputation. He's a 46-year-old guy from, from Akkar. Uh, that's relatively young in, in Lebanese public administration. And he's been the head of the criminal court in Beirut since 2017. The important distinction there between him and Sawan is that Sawan was a military investigative judge. Um, and Sawan had been part of several high-profile cases that uh, many, many people in, in the sort of independent uh, in, in independent uh, NGOs in Lebanon had questions about uh, several of his rulings and his and his uh, sort of uh, decisions. There have not been similar, uh, you know, questions raised about Tariq Bitar's conduct. But the point here again is 
is he could be you know the greatest judge in the world but will he abide by these red lines that seem to have been quite clearly set out for him so Many people had attacked Sawan over the course of it in his investigation in the past six months. We had, you know, Speaker Nabih Berri, who basically dismissed a letter by Sawan that raised suspicions about a dozen officials. We had Hassan Diab, the outgoing prime minister, who refused to go to interrogation, as did the other three ministers. And we had very other, various other politicians on different levels fighting Sawan tooth and nail whenever he tried to go against a particular official or call someone in or, or take a step that would go you know, sort of step over the bounds is what has been considered normal conduct in Lebanon's judiciary. Um, and last week, we, we also had Nasrallah come into the fore and, and, you know, launch his own criticism of Sawan and his investigation. Indeed, it wasn't the first time that Nasrallah speaks about it, but this time he spoke about, he spoke about it very seriously and he, he was clearly, you know, um, calling on Sawan individually to uh, either claim responsibility and do what Nasrallah is suggesting or, you know, uh, stepping inside. So what Nasrallah was saying was the army uh, and, the invest- and the security forces have sent already their technical reports about the explosion to the judiciary. So why is the judiciary? And when you say judiciary, in this case, we mean investigative. He means investigative uh, judge. Fadi Sawan, why has Sawan not released uh, the results of these reports to the public? This was Nasrallah's main point. He has, has made before but this time he was saying that this is the responsibility of the judiciary specifically and not uh, security forces and Nasrallah's discourse about this was that uh, people have been fed a lot of lies about what might have happened in the port so they need they have the right to know uh, the truth about it uh, and he, he said I, and I quote here uh, the investigation is over meaning you know all of the things that we have to know about what happened we already know it's just about making them public we can talk about that in a in a second uh, and then he also criticized Sawan indirectly in another way, not very indirectly, actually. He said many people have approached Hezbollah asking about uh, why the insurance companies haven't been paying compensations to the families affected by the blast. And he said that families are being made to sign contracts which waive 70% of their uh, rights, like 70% of the amounts they should get according to the insurance policy, and conditions the other 30% by saying that if the results of the investigation about the port blast conclude that it's a terrorist or military attack, then you you pay back the 30% to the insurance company because you don't have the right for it. And if they say it's otherwise, it's an accident or whatever, then you can keep the money. And anyway, Nasrallah spoke about this. It was basically, in my opinion, just uh, a weird connection that he made where he said that many people are suspicious why someone is not releasing the results and the insurance, insurance companies are waiting for these results to be revealed so that they know how, how much to pay people. And I found this whole thing a bit illogical. Like the connection didn't make sense at all in my mind, but also like several news sites were publishing things about someone having an insurance policy for his apartment in Ashrafiyi and how this proves that he's in bed with the insurance companies. I think this whole thing was a false alarm kind of, uh, it it was a bit uh, illogical uh, and naive in my opinion. It was basically uh, like a bit bit of a way to to pave the way for uh, for people not to feel uh, sorry about uh, someone going away in my opinion. But the main issue, regardless of the insurance uh, thing, the main issue is that Nasrallah, in my opinion, is pushing too far in this investigation is over discourse and saying that, you know, we need to tell people the truth because we already have it, while or maybe because investigative journalists are still finding more and more evidence and links about uh, the Syrian regime's connection to the ammonium nitrate that existed in the port and that exploded. So this is, uh, to me, the the political question. Why is Nasrallah uh, uh, so eager to publish the results at this point, while it's pretty clear from the signs we have publicly that the investigation of Fadi Sawan, the official investigation in Lebanon, is not uh, most concerned with the Syrian regime's connection yet, and most of the charges have been related to uh, administrative and political officials who are administratively responsible for the port. Right, and it, it was interesting to see the contrast in that speech by Nasrallah when you know he spoke about the port blast and got into these you know these strange sort of details about insurance that that honestly were not backed up by by facts. He said people had told him, but but th- there there was some 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 conjecture there really. And then the interesting thing is that. When, when he spoke about uh, or didn't actually speak about the killing of Lokman Slim, you know, the anti-Hazbollah activist who was assassinated two weeks ago in South Lebanon. Uh, you know, Nasrallah sort of at, uh, near the beginning of his speech indirectly responded to accusations that 
you know, the, the widespread accusations that Hezbollah was involved uh, in some way in Slim's assassination. Um, and he didn't even, uh, you know, refer to Slim by name. Uh, he didn't say the name. He simply said that Hezbollah is always seen as guilty until proven innocent. Um, and he again reiterated that people should wait for the results of the investigations, be they judiciary or, or, or security investigations, into Lokman Slim's killing to, to come out. And just so we're clear here, investigations in Lebanon into killings of people uh, in the past two decades who were either opposed to the Syrian regime or to Hezbollah, be they intellectuals or journalists or politicians, have almost always been inconclusive. We've almost never had any suspects. Um, and the only case where we really have, you know, the International Tribunal for Lebanon, which was prosecuting the case of the assassination of Rafiq Hariri, the former prime minister, found a, a Hezbollah operative guilty. And so with Lokman Slim's killing, you know, two weeks on now, no one has been arrested. We have no apparent suspects. And it seems like we're going down the similar path. And it's even being dismissed. The interior minister, uh, who is supposed to be in charge of the security forces here, sort of seemed to dismiss Lokman Slim's killing in a recent interview, where he basically said that Slim's killing, like with the assassinations of other people in, in recent months in Lebanon, be they you know, a photographer or, or former security officials, are sort of to be expected given the, the context, you know, the, the economic and social crisis and the harsh living conditions. Yes, I mean, that's a, that's a great talking point from an interior minister um, to say, you know, you should just expect the people to be assassinated for political reasons since, uh, since we're, we're, we're having uh, some bad time as a country. But anyway, this whole story about Lokman Slim, about the whole uh, the, the history of assassinations in Lebanon take that, takes us to one major question. And this is where we're very happy to have Isaiah to, to, to discuss this in depth and think about why in Lebanon there is no sort of a political accountability um, for major political crimes, let alone for corruption and things like that and bad policy and all of that. Just for big major political crimes that have been committed in the country. There hasn't been any accountability whatsoever. And as Timur said, there is a trend, there is some common denominator among many, if not most of the people who are uh, assassinated in the recent history of Lebanon which is that they are they were anti-Syrian regime or had serious issues with Hezbollah. So what's your take on that? Yes, absolutely. I, I do agree with that. Um, in fact, since the assassination started in Lebanon a long time ago, uh, the question was uh, uh, in some cases related to uh, regional uh, clashes between uh, states or, or different actors uh, that found in Lebanon uh, a theater or a scene to send messages, to eliminate foes, to uh, put pressure on the free press uh, that Beirut uh, had uh, and in which many Arab dissidents uh, used to publish. And then with the civil war and uh, later after the civil war, and especially recently in the last two decades, uh, as you were saying, uh, all of the assassinations, except when it comes to the Hariri case because of the international tribunal, all of those assassinations remained with uh, unclear answers um, no one said clearly uh, what did the investigation or uh, the work of all those who followed uh, the crime, where did it uh, lead, uh, who are the suspects, uh, uh, who are those uh, arrested and what happened to them. Uh, so this impunity that uh, has always protected criminals and always protected uh, those who target uh, their rivals uh, or their critiques or journalists, intellectuals, created a situation in the country uh, in which also the lack of independence of the judiciary, in which the uh, confessional politics, and in recent years, the uh, uh, power of Hezbollah and its hegemony created a land uh, with, uh, with full impunity, uh, with uh, violence, and with similar rhetorics, either accusing uh, Israel or uh, imperialism, uh, or asking people to wait uh, until the investigation uh, would point out the responsibilities. And of course, we, we never had those responsibilities uh, clearly uh, mentioned and, uh, and stated in, in, in the work of the investigators. So when, when we speak about these types of events, these, you know, these assassinations, uh, there's often uh, seemingly con you know, a conflation or, or even a, you know, the, the Hezbollah and the Syrian regime sort of here are, are substituted uh, for each other. They're sort of put uh, you know, on the same side entirely and, and seen as almost one and the same. 
Uh, could you sort of just draw it a bit, you know, what what roles each of them play in Lebanon and, and how they are sort of distinct from each other and, and how they work uh, in, in relation to each other? Um, yes. In fact, since Syria invaded Lebanon in 1976 under Hafez al-Assad, uh, Assad father, uh, there was a constant Syrian uh, strategy in the country uh, to create some uh, balances, to create an equation in which local but also international actors would need the Syrian army uh, to stay in Lebanon and would need the Assad regime uh, to be the mediator uh, and uh, the uh, preferred client in dealing with any kind of crisis and any kind of issues uh, in which uh, uh, the Lebanese scene might be uh, involved by, by force or by the dynamics of the conflict itself. So Syria played uh, uh, the role of a mediator between uh, uh, the U.S. and the Eastern Bloc for some time, then between Saudi Arabia and Iran, then between Iran and France, between Iran and the U.S. And after the end of uh, the civil war, uh, Assad father imposed uh, his full control with an American and Saudi blessing uh, that uh, uh, covered the 90s. And it is only during that period, in fact, that assassinations, um, I, I cannot say disappeared, but at least political assassinations uh, declined a lot. While during the civil war, right. Uh, right. the Syrian regime uh, from the founding assassination, that is uh, the one targeting Kamal Jumblat, uh, throughout uh, the assassinations of uh, president-elect Bashir Ismail, then uh, the Mufti of the Republic, Hassan Khaled, then the president-elect uh, Rene Awad, uh, and in between uh, a series of assassinations targeted, targeting intellectuals, Actuals, journalists, uh, politicians, and in many cases from uh, the leftist camp uh, of the war. All of that, in a way, ended uh, in, in the 90s, and Syria inaugurated a new era in Lebanon. But that era also ended uh, in 2004 with the uh, beginning, once again, of a new episode of uh, assassination, assassinations that was this time uh, connected to the struggle with the Syrian regime and with Bashar al-Assad, uh, uh, the, the son, over its uh, hegemony and over uh, the control of, of his regime, to, uh, of, of the Lebanese politics and even the Lebanese economy uh, and most aspects of public life in the country. Uh, the difference between that phase that ended with the, uh, with the uh, withdrawal of the Syrian troops in 2005 and what followed is that Hezbollah replaced the Syrian regime uh, in imposing the hegemony and in trying to be uh, the uh, um, uh, chief of the orchestra uh, that allocates uh, roles and attributes the uh, privileges for those or would try to punish uh, the others. Uh, with a major difference is that while Syria remained in Lebanon with no social basis, with no confessional basis, but rather through instruments and through politicians, individual allies, some political parties who are forced to deal with it or uh, who are manipulated by uh, its security services. Hezbollah, however, has a very powerful social basis related to the uh, Lebanese system itself, to the sectarian system. Uh, it is a Lebanese party and it is an ideological party with organic ties with Iran. So I think that uh, through Hezbollah, it is much more today an Iranian influence rather than Syrian. And the fact that they are allies uh, makes the Syrian regime as well either ask or tries to bring itself into the Lebanese scene once again to show that not only it survived the Syrian revolution and then the Syrian conflict, but it is also playing once again regional roles that it used to play uh, until 2005. So we are in a, uh, in a situation uh, where Hezbollah and the Syrian regime each uh, is trying to uh, show control and uh, Hezbollah definitely is, is much powerful in Lebanon because of the social basis, while the Syrian regime still has some uh, allies and uh, some uh, politicians who might serve its purposes and probably also it has allies within the security forces and the the uh, different institutions of the Lebanese establishment. That's very interesting what you said about the roles of uh, of Hezbollah and and Syria because so thinking about it in this way that you know Hezbollah is playing the role that the Syrian regime used to play. Uh, you notice a certain pattern or a certain similarity, which is that 
Neither the Senate regime nor Hezbollah were very specific and interventionist about policy affairs as much as general political and security affairs, right? So there's this th- saying in Lebanon that uh, after the civil war or this analysis that the Syrian regime was uh, the arms, like controlling the military situation or the security situation in the country, and the economic regime was in the hands of Rafi al-Hariri back then, right? And then after Rafi al-Hariri's assassination, which Syria is mostly, uh, most widely blamed for, right? Uh, after this assassination, you have this situation where Hezbollah is basically controlling the security situation, and especially actually after the mini civil war that happened in May 2008, which w- which is where Hezbollah said, okay, this country cannot uh, do anything against my military interests. That was the, the, the moment where Hezbollah said, okay, they, they hit their hand on the table and they said, Okay, our military presence dictates what happens up to a certain point in a point in Lebanese politics and Lebanese decision making. But neither Hezbollah nor the Syrian regime were basically uh, claiming responsibility for a wider political project that involves economic development or uh, decentralization or social. Or, yeah, like, nothing that basically mobilizes people apart from the general political message or political situation. Yeah. So. Why is yes. that, in your opinion? Is is it is it a way of of basically escaping a, a side of responsibility, or what is it? I think there is a similarity between uh, Hezbollah's management and Hafez al-Assad management, rather than Bashar al-Assad management. What you said is uh, uh, about the uh, kind of agreement that uh, we will manage the security situation, we will control uh, uh, or or will impose a certain stability, while we don't want to deal with the economic challenges and with the economic policies. In fact, Hafez al-Assad did allow Rafi al-Hariri to uh, carry on his economic project, the reconstruction, as long as there were some bribes to Syrian officials and Syrian officers, as long as uh, uh, there were some contracts that some Syrian businessmen could uh, benefit from. So Hariri can do that. Hariri can also, due to his international and regional uh, network, uh, elaborate Uh, relations, uh, established contacts, uh, as long as he's also considered uh, an ally or uh, as long as he does not rebel against the Syrian strategic vision in the region, that is to keep everything on hold, uh, not to be involved in seriously in any negotiations if the interest of the Assad regime is not secured, and then to impose the stability through different uh, means, uh, either through uh, uh, symbolic violence or through physical violence, and to play one actor against the other. So Assad uh, did that quite well. Hezbollah is also doing it, is uh, trying to say that we're not involved in the administration, we're not involved in the economy, uh, we're not involved in the financial uh, policies and in the banking policies of the country. We are all, we're only involved uh, in the uh, either resistance against Israel or uh, the protection of the country and its security. Uh, Bashar al-Assad did something else, in fact, and that's why he clashed with uh, Hariri and with uh, uh, some tenors of the uh, Lebanese political class, is because he wanted, and that is mainly because of the lack of experience, or if I want to use a metaphor, because he wanted to kill his father so that he can impose himself as Uh, the new president and the new governor in in Lebanon, and he did it in Syria uh, in a way as well. He wanted to uh, control everything and to impose his uh, will in all domains, including in getting uh, more shares of the economy, in imposing some businessmen, some deals. He brought uh, a new generation of politicians and uh, he supported the president uh, Lahoud uh, at the time in order to weaken those who were during the time of his father the most influential decision makers of the country. So Hezbollah is much more into the strategic management that Assad father imposed. But yes, in both cases, uh, they don't have a serious project uh, for the economy, for uh, the political institutions. What they want is a statu quo, is a stability that will allow them to elaborate their regional plans, that will allow them to negotiate outside, or in the case of Hezbollah, to wait for Iran's negotiations over its nuclear uh, file, over its uh, ballistic missiles, over its regional role, and over its regional influence, uh, 
uh, in countries like uh, Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. Uh, and of course, we have also uh, to say that Hezbollah is now uh, in um, uh, power in Lebanon, uh, while the Syrian regime was uh, extremely under pressure uh, since it withdrew from the country, but also since the revolution and then the conflict happened there. And the fact that Hezbollah intervened in Syria itself to save the regime uh, and to be with the Iranian uh, uh, militias fighting there as well, uh, gave Hezbollah a certain power in Syria and not only in Lebanon. And I can't see uh, the relation between Bashar and Nasrallah, for instance, similar to the one between Assad father and Nasrallah, where the father uh, did preserve uh, margins and had his political games and could use some other groups sometimes to create troubles for Hezbollah. He did it during the civil war while using the Amal movement. And then he agreed with the Iranians that Amal would be for the state and its administration, while Hezbollah will uh, keep uh, his arms and uh, will will remain devoted to the regional Iranian strategy, uh, but with some limits as well. Uh, we remember in 1993 or 92 during the uh, um, Arab-Israeli negotiations when Hezbollah's uh, uh, supporters demonstrated against those negotiations, there were orders to open fire on them. And uh, it was said that Assad father approved that or in fact sent a message that he would not tolerate any Iranian uh, intervention in his management of the political affairs of, of Lebanon and Syria, uh, as long as Iran is satisfied uh, with uh, the space that he left for Hezbollah uh, in South Lebanon uh, under Iranian uh, orders or through Iranian right. strategy. So it was a much more complex situation. While today Hezbollah and the Syrian regime are probably equal in Syria, uh, if I'm not exaggerating, uh, and if we forget about Russia's uh, uh, major uh, role. Uh, and in Lebanon, it's much more Hezbollah that, that manages the, the situation and tries to uh, to keep it under its control. Right. This this reminds me always of this, uh, this tweet by Mohammed Shatah. Uh, in fact, his last tweet uh, on December 27th, 2013, the morning he was assassinated, uh, and it was actually half an hour before his his uh, his car was blown up. And he said, uh, quote, Hezbollah is pressing hard to be granted similar powers in security and foreign policy matters that Syria exercised in Lebanon for 15 years, uh, unquote. So, you know, Mohammed Shatah there on, on the morning of his assassination, mm. in a way, pointing to this, the growing role of Hezbollah in Lebanon and its it's it's basically in a way a hegemony and replacement of the Syrian position. Now, uh, you know, a few years later, we had the elections in 2018. We had the return of uh, Syrian regime figures. Not that they, the, the regime ever left Lebanon, but we had the return of Elil Firzli as the deputy parliament speaker. He's you know a longtime ally of the Syrian regime. We also had the return of Jamil Al Sayed, who was really Syria's man in Lebanon and the head of general security uh, during their occupation of the country. Um, and and so I, th I think you know the question here is if if post 2005 was sort of the period of, of Hezbollah in a way taking over the reins, where are we now? Um, and and especially that you know we hear sometimes in in analysis that Hezbollah in a way is in, a, in an unprecedented point of weakness uh, that they are cornered regionally, internationally. Uh, you know that uh, that and that in fact the assassinations are uh, the return of the assassination of those is only one is is a, is a sign of that weakness. How do we square that? Uh, and uh, you know within this, the context in Lebanon today. As you mentioned, uh, the last parliamentary elections uh, witnessed the return of some uh, very close uh, of some politicians very close to the Syrian regime. But once again, most of them were elected in areas where Hezbollah has the influence uh, in terms of the uh, social basis, whether in uh, Baal Bak al hermel or in uh, the uh, Beka, in the southern Beka, um, maybe with the exception of those who were elected in the north, where Hezbollah is not uh, really present. Uh, but they were also elected in an alliance and in a moment of weakness uh, for Hariri after his Saudi episode and, and for the whole uh, March 14th or what remained of the March 14th uh, camp. Uh, I think the 2019 uh, revolution was just the beginning of uh, a new face in Lebanon. It turned the, the, the page of the previous uh, cleavage in the country between the March 8 and March 14, started something new. But then a counter-revolution 
uh, happened, and we are still through that counter revolution. For Hezbollah's weakness, um, I've never uh, uh, taken seriously this question of uh, Iran uh, being weaker regionally, uh, not because the sanctions economically did not harm the Iranians, um, but mainly because the Iranian rivals in the region are very weak, uh, whether Saudi Arabia or the United Arab Emirates or uh, any of the Gulf states who uh, uh, are in the clash or in the confrontation with Iran. They're so weak that the Iranians don't feel threatened uh, in their Iraqi position, in their uh, Lebanese position, at least for some time. And in Syria, of course, with the Russian presence, uh, they do agree on uh, some uh, common interests and they diverge on others. What happened, however, and what was alarming for the Iranians is that within the Iraqi Shia population and in Lebanon itself, the uprisings and the uh, popular mobilizations uh, did harm their uh, position and their control and the stability that they wanted to impose with their own uh, conditions. Does this explain the assassinations in Iraq? Uh, would it explain uh, the possible uh, new phase of assassinations in Lebanon uh, if the one targeting Lukman Slim was uh, the beginning? I'm not sure because uh, I think that the logic of the killers uh, is not always related to whether they are weak or, or strong. Uh, it might have its own uh, reason. And uh, in totalitarian right. regimes and movements, uh, they can kill when they are weak. They can kill when they are strong. Uh, sometimes they allow killing if they are not the direct uh, assassins or, or executors. So uh, it depends on what kind of messages they want to send to a specific uh, target, uh, what would they want to show in terms of imp their impunity, what they want to show in terms of absolute uh, power, because, you know, uh, I mean, the, the power over uh, life and death uh, is what shows how uh, absolute uh, power can be exerted on a specific group of people. So uh, all of that is difficult to to analyze for for now uh, but i think we are in a new phase in the country because of the social dynamics because of the uh, internal uprising because of the new generation uh, because of the resistance to the established order and violence might be used uh, more and more uh, against uh, some some individuals or some groups uh, to impose fear again or uh, to uh, send messages or uh, uh, to connect the Lebanese scene with other scenes in the region. Uh, and once again, impunity allows that. Uh, we've seen it recently in the uh, disaster of the, of the port and its explosion. And we've seen it in the connection between what uh, happened in Lebanon and uh, maybe war crimes uh, taking place in Syria itself if it's true that the three uh, businessmen very close to Bashar al-Assad were bringing those nitrat uh, d'ammonium uh, in order to use them in the barrel explosives or in other uh, weapons that the Syrian regime used against, its, uh, against the civilians uh, in Syria. Here the issue becomes very sensitive. To me, one of the most depressing things about the situation today is that the polarization that exists, the political polarization that exists in Lebanon today has gone back to the, the old lines of pro or anti-Syrian regime or pro or anti-Hezbollah. But this time, maybe it's a valid, basically, return of this polarization because there is a sense among most people who are not aligned with Hezbollah that we have reached a point where basically there is no potential for very serious change in Lebanon as long as Hezbollah and the Syrian regime have such influence and as long as Hezbollah has the upper hand militarily over the state itself and anyone else. And at the same time, if we go forward with this discourse of saying, you know, the kind of discourse that is, is, is proposed by people like, so say, uh, Nadim Akhtesh or, you know, the MTV or, I don't know, people who are very vocal against Hezbollah, they, they tend to go in this discourse where they say, OK, let's isolate Hezbollah as much as possible. Let's put all sorts of pressure, use all foreign allies, whoever they are, to mm -hmm. pressure Hezbollah, etc. And this path is taking us uh, not because of what people like Nadim Akhtesh are doing, but mainly because of what Hezbollah is not, is not willing to let go of in terms of power and control in Lebanon. We're going to mm -hmm. a place of extreme polarization and maybe, dare I say, like actual division, and uh, which can actually take the form of many kinds of division, uh, including geographical division of Lebanon, because we've reached a point where the two poles, the two extremes, 
or uh, people in Lebanon in general have been a, a completely different page about what is the reality that exists today and what can what is the problem who is right and who's wrong and what we can do about it like the understanding of the truth of the understanding of of the whole thing that Americans used to complain about when Trump became president that there's this thing called post truth uh, mm-hmm. America or whatever this is not obviously it's it's uh, it's mm-hmm. not an very American phenomenon or not a new thing in politics and at all actually uh, uh, in my opinion but here we see it as well in a very strong way that you know the truth the reality itself is completely contested between uh, people on the different uh, political poles and uh, the situation is just depressing because there seems to be no way around it what can be done to reduce hezbollah's power or how can we no one can convince hezbollah to become less powerful this has never happened in the history of politics even if mm. sharb al-nahas thinks it's possible it's just not possible to tell someone like give away your power right it just never happens so we can't right. force, we can't force hezbollah and we can't uh, or, or the syrian regime we can't ask them and while this is while while this situation uh, remains things are happening such as the biggest non nuclear ex- explosion in in the heart of beirut killing so many people and and destroying the city and destroying hope more than anything else and there's absolutely no hope among anyone in lebanon any reasonable person yeah. that the lebanese authorities will go and say okay the syrian regime was keeping the ammonium nitrate in the port of Lebanon on the port of Beirut because they wanted to use them for their weapons and Hezbollah knew about it and this Berri knew about it and perhaps fucking Hariri knew about it who knows right because this 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 whole political like uh, network is so connected and they all give yes. away things to each other so this is the most depressing thing for me the, the political impunity takes the form of killing people and killing the hope in the country at the same time like um, there is no there seems to be no way to fight it right and if i just may add there before you yeah. jump in yeah and we're in we're in a situation where hezbollah has anointed itself the swarm protector of the regime in lebanon and it's something we saw clearly a few days into the protest yes. when you know the hezbollah secretary general came out and said you will not be able to bring down this era you know the era of michel aoun and hariri um and and they were the ones who actually supported their return and have always uh, you know since the, the the uprising supported their return to power and so not only are they you know uh, is it you know tied to the sort of murky business of political assassinations and and you know other forms of violence it's a direct stated objective mm-hmm. to protect this regime yes uh, well this is the i mean the most challenging uh, question in lebanon today uh, and i i do believe that um, uh, it was wise to uh, avoid making the weapon of hezbollah one of the most important uh, slogans or priorities during the uprising uh, in 2019 um, even if uh, it remains i mean uh, one of the most important questions and one of the most dangerous questions in the country uh, but it became unavoidable later due to hezbollah's uh, response and due to its attempt uh, at protecting the regime and at keeping the uh, equation as it is uh, rejecting reforms rejecting uh, uh, the the question of changing the political elite and even uh, d- defending those that uh, they accused in the past of being responsible of the economic choices and uh, the consequences of of those choices today however i, I think no one uh, dealing with the political reality in lebanon can avoid mentioning hezbollah directly the weapon of hezbollah the alliance between hezbollah and iran and the alliance between hezbollah and the syrian regime however the way you do it i think would would give uh, your uh, discourse the credibility or not so if you are saying it uh, while supporting uh, the saudi regime uh, and while uh, supporting uh, despotic regimes in the region then you lose part of the credibility when you're saying it and uh, your position is a sectarian position and your problem with hezbollah is because they are shia you're also losing your credibility uh, the problem of the march 14 uh, march 8 was mainly related to that uh, to the fact that march 14 and i'm not talking about the moment the historical moment of march 14 2005 where a million people went to the streets uh, opposing political assassinations and asking the syrian regime to leave the country and calling for uh, the birth of a new lebanon that moment was a great moment however the march 14 forces who are in in their overwhelming majority uh, from the system itself with the mentality of the system uh, they don't have the real problem with corruption with sectarian politics as long as they do have their own 
people in the administration, as, as long as they are part of the clientelist uh, network and the distribution of income that they uh, manage. Uh, and Hezbollah was a threat to that, and that's why they were opposed to it, in addition to the fact that they believed that Hezbollah was targeting them, uh, they were assassinations, and that created sympathy with them because they were the victims, uh, not because they had a project or an alternative vision for Lebanon, or they could have dealt with Hezbollah uh, in a non-sectarian uh, way. The challenge today is that we cannot avoid questioning Hezbollah's weapons and uh, violence and regional alliances. But at the same time, this should not be the only question because there are lots of other reforms and lots of uh, other topics uh, that people avoided dealing with in the past, uh, uh, from uh, uh, women's rights uh, to uh, racism, uh, to the pressure that should be kept in the street on uh, uh, the banks and uh, on, on the system in general, uh, to the question of decentralization that could be a response uh, to those who are talking about the uh, uh, de facto fragmentation of the territory and the division, the geographic division that you mentioned. Uh, we can still evoke as well the independence of the judiciary and the necessity to reform all that. But uh, to be very honest and realistic, with Hezbollah, there is no local choice. Uh, one should do his or her homework uh, in order to maybe weaken uh, uh, the dynamics that allow Hezbollah to keep rising, meaning sectarian dynamics. Uh, one should uh, uh, keep promoting new ideas. Uh, what happened in 2019, as of October, was great in that sense. Uh, new mobilizations in the streets, uh, elections in the universities are showing that, uh, even if they are private universities mainly, are showing that there is something new emerging among the, the new generation in the country. So there are lots of things to, to be done, uh, regardless of Hezbollah's uh, power and uh, uh, hegemony and control. But when it comes to Hezbollah's weapon, to the violence, to the uh, organic, ideological and financial and military relation with Iran, I think it is much more a matter of uh, negotiations, mainly between the US and the Iranians themselves. It's a matter of regional order. Uh, and uh, I, I don't see uh, a solution uh, soon uh, for that. Uh, as for the Syrian regime itself, this is once again a question related to negotiations. What will Russia do? Uh, what will Turkey do? What will Iran do? What the Americans are preparing to? Uh, uh, are they going to be involved once again? Or they will keep the same approach to Syria, which is only being concerned with the Kurdish area uh, and not just allowing and not allowing the Russians to impose their final solution uh, without uh, any more engagement? All of those are questions uh, and uh, showing as well that the Syrian regime itself is a hostage of, of the game, of the conflict. And that's why I, I said previously, it is like Hezbollah in a way. Uh, they depend uh, on Iran. Uh, they depend, in the Syrian case, on, on Russia, uh, without denying that they do have other uh, tools and uh, other possibilities, and that Hezbollah has as well a popularity among uh, the Shia community that needs to be uh, understood, analyzed, assessed. And uh, as long as there are sectarian politics in the country, as long as those who are opposed to Hezbollah use sectarian language and discourse and metaphors, I don't see why Hezbollah will be weakened among its own community. Uh, there was uh, fears, maybe, and that's what you mentioned previously uh, concerning uh, uh, getting weaker or being threatened by the situation. Maybe the fact that they saw the system collapsing and the economic disaster happening would have alarmed them and uh, they have an interest in preserving it uh, functioning in a way even if uh, uh, with the uh, very bad conditions uh, so that their social uh, basis would not be uh, harmed or affected but they're beyond that now i think they are uh, reconsidering the whole configuration uh, of the situation in the country they prefer to deal with the people that they know even if they don't like, uh, like Hariri and, and uh, his allies. Uh, they want to keep on uh, as a president because he's weak and they do uh, decide uh, the most uh, important things. And they want a statu quo until uh, in Tehran, uh, there is a new perception of the region based on the negotiations with America, based on the elections that Iran will, will witness, and uh, based as well on, on what will happen in the Gulf. 
Uh, now, in the Gulf, uh, Saudi Arabia is under pressure because of Yemen and because of the uh, Biden's administration new approach. Uh, and all of that uh, will also have an impact on uh, our miserable country. So, uh, yes, there are reasons for being pessimistic, uh, but uh, let's use Gramsci, uh, pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will, as a principle or as a guiding principle for, for, next, uh, for the next phase. Right. I mean, a lot of people have been very pessimistic and, and you know, the, the, the sort of the fall from 18 months ago, from that high peak of, of the, the uprising to, to today is, is really quite something. Uh, we, yes. you know, and, and I've even been hearing in, in, you know, in recent days and weeks this idea that tr try to fight in Lebanon, but don't give it too, too much because in the end it will kill you, um, you know, mm. and, and people are sort yeah. of turning away. And, and, and even so, among the people in the diaspora, I remember the hopes and, and the pride of people in uh, uh, October, November, December uh, 2019, and even January, February, uh, before uh, uh, fatigue and uh, before a new deception and uh, with the explosion in the port. I think uh, many of those who are here uh, say that we're, we're lucky to be away. Uh, and that's what uh, we also need to work on to keep people mobilized and connected and interested in, in being uh, engaged and, and committed for uh, some political action in Lebanon. Indeed. Thank you so much, Diad, for, uh, for all of your insights. I, I really uh, I appreciate the last few points you made, especially about, uh, about hope, optimism and pessimism. And I, um, and I think that, you know, as people, as activists, as commentators, whoever we are, um, when we're honest about uh, who to blame for what and uh, how to assess things and how to distribute responsibility. At the same time, um, that we're, when we're realistic about in our analysis and in our positioning, I think um, we, we will always, it's, it, it, and history will not stop, right? It will be, there will no. be a point where, like the thing we, we sensed, we felt on the evening, on October 17, right? Uh, this moment of euphoria that uh, finally there is something that's happening. This moment, it will not be the same, but some similar moment might happen in the future again, and it will actually definitely happen in the future again. And that moment uh, requires us to be ready uh, with discourse, with uh, research, with whatever we're doing, right? With the mobilization and organizing on the grassroots level to be uh, able to, you know, inflict change at that moment. So thank you so much, Absolutely. Ziad, for, uh, for, for being with us on this podcast. I just want to say I, I really appreciate your presence, and we probably will have you again on this podcast sometime soon because there are so many things we want to discuss with you. I with hope great you pleasure. I, I thank you so much for having me uh, and, and with uh, pleasure and interest for, for any other uh, opportunity as well. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ziad. Honestly, thanks, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you both. And I hope to see you soon in Beirut as well. Hope so. All right. Uh, that was it from the from us this week. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, I'm Nizar Hassan. I'm Taymur Azhari. And I'm Ziad Majid. And this was the Lebanese Politics Podcast. Lebanese Politics Podcast is brought to you by myself, Nizar Hassan, Benjamin Red, produced behind the scenes by Susan Wilson, and the music is by Omar Elfil.